Hi everybody, it's Josh with Talk About Trek, and tonight we have finished up the Q Continuum Saga. Q Strike is uh, is done. We finished it, and we've loved it. Uh, Greg Cox did a great job with this saga. Um, each book was kind of like its own different thing, went its own different way, told an interesting story, and... I think it all kind of finished up really well here with Q Strike. So um, let's just kind of jump right in here. Q and Picard face the supreme challenge. And of course, here on the cover you have Q, and in the background you can see uh, the devious half face there of Zero, and I think this is the uh, the female Q there as well that you can see. So so. Uh, this one picks up right where we left off from the last one with the basically Q and Picard kind of observing past Q in his folly in releasing this villainous Zero and how, well basically how this book starts out is how Zero gets taken down and uh, things go from there. So let's read right from the back here. The mischievous... Mis mischievous creature who calls himself Q has subjected Captain Jean-Luc Picard and the crew of the Starship Enterprise to many of their strangest experiences. But little had been known about Q's curious existence, is it existence or that of the advanced dimension from which he comes. Now Picard knows more than he ever dreamed about an ancient conflict whose consequences might spell the doom of an entire galaxy. The Q Continuum. Q Strike. The Galactic Barrier has fallen and Q's oldest enemy is free once more. Captain Picard and his crew find themselves in the middle of a cosmic war between vastly powerful entities. The future of the Federation may be at stake, but how can mere mortals turn the tide in such a hu superhuman battle? Picard has to find a way, or neither the Q Continuum nor the Galaxy will survive. Cool, yeah. Uh, just an interesting... Uh, the, the whole thing has been very cool because it gives you this look at Q that you have never seen before. This kind of immense background and this, I don't know, a kind of a, a greater look into the, the grand scale that Q and beings like Q like are a part of. And the, the book certainly starts out that way as well. But before we get into that, I wanted to highlight the cover art. Oh, oh, we've lost the mouse. Hang on. Because I do particularly enjoy this. So let's take a second to have a look at all three together. So we start, we got Q-Zone, Q-Space, and of course, I'm going to hide this one here, Q-Strike. And as you can see, they all kind of maybe flow together. And you can even see the uh, in the between the second and third books, I believe that's going to be the the villainous zero. But he's supposed to have like a beard too. So I don't, I'm not really even sure. Maybe these are just supposed to be cues uh, all in the background there. So, but anyway, it's been a great trilogy so far, and I was really happy to kind of get into this point too in TNG where they start diving into these these sagas. Uh, looking down the road here, I've got the Double Helix Saga, uh, Genesis Wave Saga, I've got Gem World, uh, so just a lot of cool stuff coming up there. I've always, I always like to get into things that just have a continuing story to carry on. So, yeah, so uh, a fun book, a fun saga. If you don't want to be spoiled, then just uh, you can stop it right there. We're gonna kind of dive into my notes and just a little bit of ranting and raving about what we thought about. Q strike and this the whole Q continuum as a whole, right? So we left off with Q and Zero uh, testing the Takan Empire, and the Takan Empire they passed the test, and Zero was not happy about that. So he prematurely blew up their sun, uh, destroyed their empire, which brought down the wrath of the Q continuum. So this one starts out with this, basically, at first, uh, the Continuum comes in, and uh, a couple of uh, 
they kind of get into an initial battle, and when it seems that the continuum is going to be too strong, uh, two of Zero's cronies, Gorgon and um, Asterix, this kind of energy being, they both flee. And uh, they show up later in uh, TOS as different entities. So, But the battle ranges on between Zero and the Continuum and uh, the One, his other crony that kind of remained. So you have this, the book starts out with this kind of epic, aeons-long war that goes back and forth between them, uh, where finally the Q are able to turn the tides and subdue the One, and it's kind of funny what they do to him is they basically systematically delete his body parts until he's nothing but a floating head, and then they exile him to the center of the galaxy. And of course, he is who appears in, uh, what is it, Star Trek V, or whatever, as the uh, the god who uh, Cybok is trying to release, you know? So uh, I think that was a very cool kind of way that he called that and like brought that into it, you know? Did I say that right? I think I did. Yeah, Final Frontier, right? Oh. Anyway. But, here's the thing. Uh, the, uh, oh, the cues, too, uh, that come in. So, I think it's kind of interesting what they did here, too, is uh, Q has four other Q Continuum members that kind of come to his aid here to, to bring Zero down. And one of them, it suspiciously looks like Picard. So Picard's thinking, like, he made him look like that because he's, like, an authority figure, and it's just kind of a, like, a jab at him, maybe something. And then, of course, his uh, fiance, the, the Lady Q. And then I think that they're also talking about the other Qs that showed up, like the John Tess Q. I think he was here helping as well. But anyway, there's this immense battle that goes on between all these Qs and eventually just Zero. And uh, the first part of the book is very interesting because of the way you're shown the scope of this battle. You get like a chapter that's like just just this one planet. And because of uh, one little move in the battle, that their sun has been darkened. So now this whole race has to go underground. And, uh, and there's like just a few little hints here and there of how this gigantic battle between the Continuum and Zero over thousands of years like vastly affected like the whole quadrant of space basically and uh, one of the interesting things that happens is during the battle uh, Q, the original Q, uh, deflects something away from him, it actually goes and hits Earth and wipes out the dinosaurs and that kind of comes up later. but <laughs> So basically, Q is responsible for the extinction of the dinosaurs on Earth in this book. So Now, they're finally able to subdue Zero and kind of bring him to justice, and they take him into the continuum where him and Q are both judged for, for what they've done. Um, Zero is, of course, banished, and uh, they set up the galactic barrier. So Zero's banished outside of the, the galaxy, and then the Q go up and set up this galactic barrier to keep him out and uh, keep him away from everybody. So so they do that. And then for Q, his punishment is that he has to now take care of Earth. He's in charge of watching over and making sure that development of Earth kind of goes along as it should since he's responsible for the extinction of the dinosaurs. So that's kind of a fun little way to tie in as to why he... You know, why has he always been so interested in Earth? So so that gives you, like, the initial starting point. So now that Q has explained the full story, he is able to return Picard to the bridge of the Enterprise. And the Enterprise at this time has... They've left the Great Barrier. And... Or wait, no, no. They're still within the Great Barrier, Right? Yeah, they're, I mean, they're still within the Great Barrier. They're hiding from the Calamarine, who are outside. And uh, Now, there's another character that's been introduced in the previous two books, a Betazoid scientist named Lem Fall, and it's been his goal to break through the barrier. And unbeknownst to him, he's been influenced by Zero from the other side. And now that they've gotten kind of closer and closer and closer, they're like right within the barrier, his power is 
right there at peak. So he's able to actually kind of take over and give this guy a bit of his power. So then Lem Fall is able to kind of advance to the next level of, you know, and he's using telekinesis and all this, and he's able to complete his mission, launch this torpedo, and uh, the, the Great Barrier isn't taken down completely, as it said on the back of the book, but just a tiny little hole is put in, and it's just a tiny enough hole for Zero to sh shoot his way through and, and escape out into our our quadrant, our galaxy. So, so now Zero is here, and then the book changes changes pace kind of completely here at this point, where you have kind of these, I don't know, varying different, and, and honestly, this is not how I was expecting this to end. It was a much like a kind of a lower key ending than I was expecting from this, what started out as like this epic aeons long battle, you know? So, so now they're on the Enterprise and the idea that Zero has is to keep it on the Enterprise, basically. So he he's fond of playing games, so he shackles Q, uh, basically making it so Q can't use his normal powers to just kind of flash around anywhere, and invites him to a game of hide-and-seek. And when he finds him, he's going to kill him. And then Zero, at this point, he's looking very, very ragged after his long time being trapped out of the galaxy. So his normal form of like a, maybe an evil Tom Bombadil kind of guy is looking really ragged. And he's also got these, you know, spider-like arms that are coming out as well. And now he's got like a weapon in each arm. He's got a gun and he's got an axe and he's got a boomerang. And he's got all these different things. And he's going to be hunting down Q throughout the Enterprise. So he's going to be a little playing a little hide and seek with Q. Um, the other part of this story here going on now is the ascended Lemfall has basically made it his goal now to study young Q, baby Q, lowercase Q. And um, so he finds lowercase Q, and much to the chagrin of Lady Q, is able to take baby Q, kind of lock him up into a little thing. He turns the whole ward there, the nursing ward, into his own little experiment bay and starts running experiments on baby Q. And of course, Lady Q is trying to stop him from doing what he's doing, but he has too much power given to him from Zero and is basically able to kind of like shut her down. Eventually, she gets mad enough where she's starting to get through to him, and that's when this guy's son comes in. Now, his son was also awake when they went into the Great Barrier, so he's also infected with a little bit of this kind of magic mental energy, you know? So, at first, he's like, he's kind of put off. He's like, Dad, what are you doing? But then his dad's like, help me subdue her, you know? Help me with this. And he's as you know, he's just like excited now. He's like, Oh, my dad wants me, my dad wants my help, he's excited to do it. So he actually, using his power, traps the lady Q with a couple of tiny Tholian ships and a little tiny Tholian web. Man, this story gets kind of crazy. This is fun. Uh, but listen, Lady Q is not out of it yet. She kind of musters the last of her energy and she zaps the the boy Milo in there into the web with her, throttles him by the neck, and basically says to Lem, you know, you have my boy, I have your boy, I will kill your boy if you don't release my boy. So, it's, you know, son for son here. Well, I'm willing to trade. And then, like, for an instant, he, you know, you think maybe he's going to do it, but then, no, he's like, he totally turns his back on his son and just goes right back to his experiments. Right, I like this dude. This dude was evil, man. Like, I, I, he was an interesting character, and just like a really, he's a really poor dad. Very poor dad. You know, he, he just did not do well by his kids. So, old Lem goes back to his experiments. Milo is heartbroken, and of course, the lady Q uh, is not even going to do that. Uh, she releases Milo, and then. Now the tables get turned. But let's just let's take a break there, because now we're doing like two stories at once. 
we'll jump back over to Hide and Q, which is going on. It's an episode, but uh, O and Zero, or Zero and Q playing hide and seek throughout the Enterprise. So it's kind of a fun little bit where Q will find some place to hide and then kind of be reminiscing, going thing through his, going through his head, and then Zero catches up with him and throws a boomerang at his head and almost gets him or nearly shoots him or nearly stabs him or something like that before he's able to nearly, and or, you know, just very quickly get away to some other place or something like that. So you have this interesting little part there where Zero and Q were kind of chasing each other about through the ship. During this time, Captain Picard is trying to figure out how can we get out of this? What is the actual the diplomatic way, the solution that we can do this the right way. And of course, he tries to reach out to the Calamarain. So at this point, they've left the Great Barrier, and actually, Zero set them on a course to go visit the interior of the galaxy to set free the One, the, the giant floating head there. So oh, in doing so, he actually killed the Ensign who was at the con, and then brought his body back to life as a puppet. Uh, which was pretty dark, and then Captain Picard was forced to vaporize his uh, his crewman, which was, again, it was pretty dark. There was some dark stuff here, but that's not the only the only darkness here. Uh, the book is also, or the series is also introduced to us, uh, Beta Leroyo, who is a Ar Argosian, and if you remember the TNG episode, I don't remember the title, but Roga Dinar was an Argosian who's like a basically they were soldiers who were like in, you know given enhanced abilities and things like that so she's the security officer of the E uh, she's been currently sent to sick bay because of the the mental effects of the Great Barrier but she's getting ready to come back in a, in a big way here in the story and I always wondered like where were they going with this character and this is this is where it was ending up so so Picard reaching out to the Calamarine. He wants to set up uh, some way to work out a solution to this. And he's able to actually kind of get through to them by telling them some things that he, he shouldn't know, you know, because he was able to see, see the past, see what happened to them in the past. So he reaches out to them, he's able to do that, and he's able to, I, don't, I guess, reach them through a gesture of immense trust by lowering the shields. And by doing that, they could have been destroyed instantly, but instead, the Calamarine... I keep saying Calamarine, and I just want to keep saying Alamarine, and that makes me think of the freaking DS9 episode where they're all jumping around, <laughs> you know, Alamarine, count to four. And I'm not going to... Calamarine, the Calamarine, count to four, and then one more. The Calamarine kind of take the form of like a, like a single gaseous cloud there so they can communicate with Picard. And Picard, I think, expresses what he plans on doing. And they don't tell you that right then and there to the to the reader. They kind of dive back into the other bits of the story, which is, oh, Milo having uh, have his heart broken, basically, and kind of see what his father has turned into, goes up to the female Q and says, I'm willing to work with you. Let's take my dad down. So using their powers together, they're able to take Lem Fall down, uh, knock him out, remove the, the ability from him, and Lady Q is reunited with lowercase Q, and that situation is resolved rather happily. So, um, On the bridge, of course, Riker or Picard is working out his deal with the Calamarine. Throughout the rest of the ship, uh, Q is trying to evade Zero, and finally he figures that a good place to end up would be in the holodeck. So he programs the holodeck and he tries to hide in there, but Zero eventually finds him, and then Zero uses his ability to change the holodeck's environment to the original environment where Zero and Q met, which is like this kind of arctic wasteland where he was exiled to initially. So. This is where the final battle is going to take place. So uh, he stalks Q, he finds him, and he actually throws a spear and spears Q through the leg. And, um, you know, it's kind of, this is like the, 
the final moments for Q, you know? It's right there at the end for him, so. Now, Captain Picard's plan comes into effect. He beams onto the holodeck with the Calamoraine, and at the request of Veda Laroyo, uh, she comes as well. She's made her way back to the bridge, and as the chief security officer, she feels she needs to see this through to the end, right? So, what's going to happen? Anyway, so they get there, and they trek through the snow, and they find Zero, and they find Q, and they kind of get there just in time. And it's basically like a, a battle of wits, where Zero has this spear telekinetically driving towards Q's heart, and Q is telekinetically trying to push it away from Zero, and they're kind of like fighting back and forth together. The Calamarain are noticed by Zero, who does the same trick he did to them before by, like, compressing them and squeezing them together. He freezes them in this atmosphere, and then they turn from a gas to a liquid, and then they fall to the ground and they freeze. So that threat taken care of, he turns back to Q, and even Captain Picard is like, got his hands on the spear, trying to pull it back. He's getting ignored by Zero, because he's really not doing anything here. But this is when the, the tide turns, and this, I guess, this character's kind of arc comes to a completion. And I keep talking with my hands. So much. Talk with your hands so much. But uh, anyway... Beta Laroyo sees the frozen Calamarain there uh, in the snow and has an idea. She pulls her phaser out and she thaws them out. And it's working. They're thawing out. They're steaming up. They're turning back into their original form when Zero notices this. So what does he do? Kind of flicks his fingers and sets her phaser to overload. She knows she's got less than a minute before this thing is going to explode in her hand, right? But they're not quite thawed yet. Whoa, yeah, so he, that's, what, that's what happens at the end here. So you have this you know, epic scene at the end where she just has to keep on firing to thaw these people out, right? So they can turn back into a gaseous entity and save the day. And, and that's what she does. Right up until the very last minute when the thing goes off in her hands and blows her up off into the snow and she has her final thoughts and she, and she dies. And that's it. She dies. So this character that we've known to kind of, we've grown to enjoy over these past three books has her final sacrifice, you know, and it kind of saves the day. And because of her sacrifice, the Calamarain have like a big change of heart too. And with their sacrifice, they're then willing to join with Q, which is what they do. They kind of take over Q and then Q and the Calamarain become one. And then their power is just way too much for Zero. And he takes Zero out. He basically kind of lessens and lessens his power, turns him into nothing, turns him into a tiny bug, and squishes him. And in the end, it's revealed that he's put back on the other side of the Great Barrier. The Continuum has been convinced to repair any breaches, any cracks, anything like that to the Great Barrier just to ensure that Zero is not going to be able to get out anytime soon. So, boy, I think that's about it, gentlemen and ladies. We've, uh, we've reached the end of our story. Um, no good ending for Lem Fall. He's basically left comatose at the end. Uh, his son is going to take care of him, but already uh, like a victim of this disease that had been tearing him down. It doesn't seem like he has long to live, so uh, the Q family comes and visits Picard, and pretty much not to, well, they don't really ever thank him, but just kind of one more final uh, goodbye, I guess, to make sure that everything is, is okay before they take off into their next adventures, and I think Q's next adventures after this are uh, something more with Janeway in the Delta Quadrant, probably, so. Yeah, the, and the book ties up rather quickly. The the Calamarain aren't mentioned again, but, you know, now they're on good terms with the Federation, so maybe in the future there can be some kind of exchange of information. Uh, they were an interesting species, and I liked in the initial books how 
the author gave you a look like inside of the what the life of this life form was like you know and they were and also i think in addition to that i liked how the author gave you this look into into the life of these advanced beings so the cues the zeros of the the metrons the you know, there's others I'm failing to mention, but anyway, there's so many of these kind of like ultra beings out there, and it was interesting the way that I say interesting too much. It was oh, I need to think of a different word. I liked the way that he did it, <laughs> but no, seriously, uh, the way that it was written, how like the the continuum and zero were these larger than universe creatures playing out this epic battle of this epic scale over thousands of years that was affecting the whole quadrant uh, just was really well done and well written and I think it kind of gave that scale of what these you know what these people are and like they're how different they are from the rest of the galaxy so just uh, well done well done Mr. Cox I really enjoyed that so yeah that was the Q Continuum I wanted to get it done a little bit sooner, but hey, I'm not going to complain. That was three books and, you know, maybe two weeks and a half, something like that. And look at that. It brings us right up to number 49. Now, I was going to take a break and read this, which I got for my birthday from my father-in-law, and I'm stoked to jump into but I have a real problem with ending on a 49 and I happen to look and see that number 50 a nice round number 50 here is none other than Dyson Sphere and I always thought maybe it was a uh, a novelization of the episode but it's not that at all. I think it's something else. I think they're going back to the Dyson to the Dyson sphere to explore it more, to learn more about it. Interestingly enough, Enterprise E is not on the this is the D on the cover here. So I don't know. I am gonna dive into this and in, judging by its size, I think I can get through it fairly quickly. So that'll be the idea. Read Dyson Sphere, jump into firewall. And it's going to be a, a good bit of reading here for mid-March. So, yeah, that's it. We're done for tonight. Actually, we're not done for tonight. We're going to do some more stuff after this. But we're done talking about books for tonight. So, well, as always, everybody, thank you so much for hanging out with me and talking about Star Trek books for 28 minutes and 6 seconds. Live long and prosper. We'll see everybody in the next one. Bye.